think most of you know Barry Webster. He's been tying for 10 or 11 years now as part of the Roadkill Roundtable. Uh, we all tie together every Saturday morning usually. Uh, last time in our last meeting, Barry was going to tie, and Dave Beck can gave a very long explanation of what he was tying, so kind of rushed through Barry, so I invited him back tonight. There's handouts here of what he's tying if anybody wants them. All right, so I've got a couple of flies that we're going to tie tonight. The first one is a uh, rusty spinner, and this is one that I got, um, I believe it's out of Fly Tire Magazine, but um, uh, what's, uh, what's the guy that does all the videos, tight line? Um, oh, yeah. Um, I'm drawing a blank real Not quick. Yeah, Tim Flagler. Tim Flagler. Right. Yeah, uh, it's a Tim Flagler pattern that he tied, and I, I really like the way it looked. Um, it it's a classic dry fly pattern with a little floating on these wings. It's a synthetic material that I'll I'll talk about. It it floats like a cork on stuff with the long microfibit tails. So <clears throat> the materials on this are microfibit tails. It's got a uh, biot, uh, either goose or turkey, depending on the size of the hook that you're tying it on. I'm going to tie these with turkey biots. Um, and biots, if you're not familiar with them, I've, I've kind of wrinkled that one all out all over the place, but it is the leading edge of the flight feather. So if you were, had a turkey wing sitting here, and they, what they do is they split the rachis right down the middle, take off all the back of the feathers, and leave just the very short, tight barbs on the front. And um, I don't, anybody know why we call those biots? I don't. Um, but anyway, that's B-I-O-T is what they're called. And this is wrapped around the body. And if you'll notice in the picture that I'm showing there, you can see the segmentation on there. And the actual biots are a, a smooth barb, but they have a raised kind of frilly set of microbarbules on one side. And the only thing really tricky about this pattern is getting the biot tied on so that when you wrap it, the frilly part is sticking out rather than getting buried under the wraps of bio. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to tie these on a size 12 just so you can see them fairly well. I tie them typically in 12, 14, 16s, and 18s. Um, 18s is a pretty small pattern on this, but again, if the uh, mayflies that you're trying to simulate are small, you you want a range of sizes in there. I also vary sometimes the wing material. Um, I'll pass some around here in a minute. You can see I tied them with a, a more uh, rusty colored spinner. But the wing material that I'm using is from Fly Tires Dungeon. It's called PIP, and, and I don't know what the PIP stands for. Uh, if you haven't found Fly Tires Dungeons yet, um, I have no affiliation with them. I do not own stock in the company. Uh, but they are a great uh, materials, mostly synthetics, and uh, it, it's very, very reasonably priced. What I buy is they have different grab bags from them, <coughs> and for 25 bucks you could get what would cost you in one of our local fly tying shops probably 125 bucks. And they have all kinds of synthetics, um, flash boo, um, dubbing materials of all kinds and everything. So it's one of those you might want to check out. Um, so I'll get the uh, thread started on the hook. And I'm going to pull out about 8 inches or so of thread to start this. And I'll explain in a second why. Get the thread started in the back third of the hook, and I'm going to clip that thread off, clip the tag off. Now I'm going to set that someplace where hopefully I can find it again, and I'm going to grab the microfibits. 
this is material sold in fly shop. Um, it's a synthetic material. Um, you can also use um, paint brushes. Um, probably not an old used gummed up paintbrush, but if you could find a, a, a nylon paintbrush, um, it's a reasonably inexpensive way to get the same material because it appears to be the same thing to me. Old shaving brush. Yeah. What? Old shaving brush yeah. as well. I haven't seen one of those in 60 years. <laughs> That's why it's an old one. You've got two. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've, I've selected two of those uh, micro fibbits. And, you know, traditional wisdom is the tail's the length of the shank. If you look at a mayfly and look at their tails, what you see is they're, they're two to three or maybe even almost four times the length of their body. So don't be afraid to tie that in there a little bit long. I'm going to tie it in. This is probably two and a half shank length, something like that. And I'm going to tie them in, trying to keep that right on top of the hook. And I'm going to bind that down a little ways. And I'm going to just use my fingers to gently separate those two. Um, as you tie the fly, and if it didn't do anything else at this point, as you toss it in the water and everything, those tails tend to go back together. And it looks like there's only a single tail. So I want to do something to separate the tails a little bit. And that nice piece of thread that I set here has disappeared. <laughs> That's yeah, I, it doesn't matter. I'll, okay. I'll get another one. I'm just going to get me a length of thread here. So I've got about an eight inch piece of thread that Theoretically, it was the long tag that I clipped off. But I'm going to take that and double it and bring it under the hook. And I'm just going to carefully bring it up between the two micro fibbits. And I can pull those and I can control the separation of those feathers. And they will not go back together because it's got a double piece of thread in there between them separating them. I'm going to take my. Yes. You did a real nice job of keeping them on top and symmetrical. Whenever I tie these in, they're in left field and right field, but they're never on top and symmetrical. So any tricks for that? Yeah, it's just finger pressure. And it's holding them with your fingers on top of the hook shank. And as your thread, it naturally as you take your thread over the top and pull down and put tension on it, it's going to pull the material over behind the hook. Um, it does on mine too. There's nothing. I didn't, you know, spit on top of the hook shank and <laughs> glue it down or anything like that. I just know that that tension is there when I bring it around, and so I'm in effect putting counter tension with my fingers and rotating it back to the top all the time. Are a pitch dub always automatically centered on the top? No. No. Nope. nope. It, it does, it, it usually does, but I've, I've found some slick material that oh. even, and, and what uh, Peter's talking about is if I had the material up above the hook shank, brought the thread up and did a loose wrap just around the material, and then came back down and pulled that around the hook and then applied pressure upwards, it pulls the material straight down and tends to have it go directly on top of the hook. Um, I, I've just gotten used to doing it with my fingers. That's an extra step in there. And it, 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 if, if you've got a lot of material, especially um, it, like squirrel hair is one of the slickest things I've ever tried to tie with. A, a good way to do that is that um, pin trap or whatever you want to call it and that will tend to if you think about it it's got a loop around the bundle of material I go around the hook and I pull straight up the only place that can go is straight down on top of the hook and it does tend to get it to stay on top of the hook a little better but yeah Jeff there there's nothing magic that helps thank you nothing magic there other than 
I, I'm just used to it doing that, and so controlled it with my fingers. Okay, I'm going to click off, click off the tag ends on that, and I'm going to create a thread body, and I'm going to go up uh, about two thirds of the way up the hook shank because that's where I want my body to go, and I'll have an abdomen in front of that. And this is 14 knot Vivas, so it doesn't build very quickly. And, I, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time doing this, but um, I, I would typically take the time to build a tapered body under there because the bia, when I tie it on there, it's going to follow the shape of whatever I have underneath it. So I'm just creating some thread wraps in there to give me a little bit of bulk to you tie like that on. Do you like that straight eye rather than the downturn for this? Yeah, I, I don't pay any attention to them. I buy hooks where I get good prices, and some of them are downturn, some of them are up eye, some of them are straight eye. I, I personally can't tell that it makes a bit of difference. Uh, I'm sure it affects the dynamics of how it's being towed through the water column, but <coughs> for my purposes, I, you know, I, don't, I don't really care. Okay, um, I'm going to select one of the individual buyouts, and I, I didn't do a very good job of prepping this. Normally what I'll do is come in, and there's some buyouts down towards the bottom of this, that are shorter than the ones that I want to use. And a lot of times what I'll do is just come in and strip off those bottom ones. And the reason I do that is because I want to actually take this biot, you can see it sticking up there, and I just want to peel it back. And when I peel it back, it creates a little curly cue. And the reason I like that on there is it's a clue to me to how to tie in the biot so that I get that frilly edge out. And what I like to do is leave that curlicue on there and tie in the biot so that curlicue is facing towards the back. In other words, I'm going to come in and tie this in right now like that so that curlicue is facing down. I'm going to tie that in, bind it down back to where the tail is tied in, take the scissors, clip off the leading edge of that, and then I'm going to take my hackle pliers and put them on that biot. And again, the curly cue is facing down, and I'm just going to let that drop down, get my thread up out of the way. And I'm going to begin to wrap that in kind of adjacent touching turns. And that's not right. I don't know if you can see that or not, but the fuzzy parts are not up. And this is, it's one of those things where three-fourths of the time when I do this, it goes on right. Occasionally, it does not. So I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get a little longer one this time. Okay, I'm going to try to do the same thing. Get the curly cue facing down. And I would normally unwrap my thread and get rid of that residue under there, but it's it's just going to add to the body underneath it. <clears throat> Okay, bring my thread up out of the way. Go in here again, hold the biop such that the curly cue is down. And let's see if that works. Nope. You can you can watch this and you can tell, and I'm I'm just gonna twist that so it turns over the other way. So it looks like it was a concave and convex side of the, the biot. You've got the concave side on the 
Um, you get the convex side. You get the hump on the outside. I don't know. I got the frilly edge up. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a little better. It's still not as good as I would like, but you can see those ridges and the segmentation in there. So. Is that particular to the yellow biot or any biot? No, it's any biot. They, they all have that little frilly edge on it. And I've never seen that done before like that, but I think that really looks... Yeah. Sometimes you want just a smooth body. Yeah. And so in that... Guys, we can hear you. Okay, so I'll clip off that tape. You are not. <laughs> You're still not on mute. Okay, now I'm going to put the wing on. Um, when this stuff comes... Hey guys, go ahead and self-mute, but if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. Yeah. We answered it. Okay. Um, when this stuff comes from the factory, this PIP material, it comes in a big bundle, and I've used this mostly. But the reason I like this stuff, and let me, I'm going to grab one right out of the package that uh, is newer. Here, here's a different color. Um, This is again that uh, pip okay. from fly tires, and this this is gold colored, um, which I tie sometimes. But the way it comes, it's got a, um, a zip tie in the middle of it holding it together, and it's in strands. And the strands on this are the perfect size for tying this particular material. Do you use that for a shelf tail too? Yeah. You, this is a, it's a synthetic material. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Uh, Anton, <coughs> Zelon, you know, something in that form. But it's a waterproof synthetic material and it just makes great winging material. I use it for tying parachute posts. I use it for trailing shucks, all yeah. kinds of stuff. It's, it floats real well. It, it does float real well. Now, I go ahead and put floating on it, which is probably, you know, belt and suspenders. But uh, I put floating on it, and then it, it, it does not get water off. Okay, so what are, I've... Sorry, what are the alternatives you would use? Um, Antron, Zelon, any synthetic kind of crinkly material like that would work just fine for this. <coughs> yeah, it, or polypropylene. Uh, yeah, true. Yeah, um, you'll see that in a minute. Okay, so I, I cut about uh, two inches of that material and I'm going to tie them onto the hook shank and I'm going to use the classic figure eight pattern attachment to attach that. So I'm just wrapping around it in two different directions, binding that down again on top of the hook shank. Okay, and that's all there is to attaching that wing. Couldn't be any simpler. I am going to take a little dubbing and dub a, a fairly skinny noodle of material around that and I'll use the same figure eight pattern with my dubbing so that it goes over and under the material and doesn't, doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, this material that I'm using is some that I made myself. Um, it's uh, uh, natural rabbit and I think it's got some muskrat in it and um, I'm not sure what else I threw in there but um, I love making my own dubbing and I have lots of skins of muskrat and rabbit um, and 
I went to Walmart and splurged $12.95 on a coffee grinder. And you take and put all that stuff in the coffee grinder, turn it on, and it does a wonderful job. You can put a little sparkle into it if you want, put some yeah. um, sparkle dubbing or something you like can that buy in there. that UV2 stuff? Yeah. The lightener that comes in lighter or darker? Yep. Yep. And it's fantastic. Yep. Because I use it for. I like, uh, they make a, um, a sparkly dubbing that's called rainbow, and it comes in a dark rainbow and a light rainbow. <laughs> And it is just a great addition to any dubbing to just give it a little spark. The, the fly tires dungeon? No, um, I think I got this from Orvis. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so anyway, I've got a fairly sparse noodle of dubbing dubbed on there. And I'm going to continue my figure eight wraps until I get all of that thread kind of covered up. And again, I'm going in a figure eight pattern around there and I'll pull the wing forward a little bit um, to cover up the back end of where it was dubbed with the uh, or covered with the biot and as you can see I've kind of created a little abdomen in there with the dubbing and that's really all there is to this fly so I'm going to whip finish that. Put about a five turn whip finish on it. And I would typically put a little Sally Hansen's on there just to ensure that my head stayed on. And you can, you can clip these wings. This is too long, I think. Uh, <clears throat> you can clip these wings to any length you like. I particularly like them. Pull them back and about halfway down the tail and clip those off to that length. To me that looks like what I see most of the spinners looking like. And again when this hits on the water those microfibits lay in the surface tension of the water that wing material lays in the surface tension of the water and it looks just like a, a spinner and a spinner is a mayfly that's come back after it's come out of the water, gone and mated, come back, laid its eggs and its life cycle is ba basically over <coughs> and it will come and die and land on the surface of the water right after it's laid its eggs. They're called spinners because as they're dying, and I, apparently they're just flying along and all of a sudden croak and they come fluttering down to the water, but they, they tend to, you know, almost auto-rotate as they come in, and I think that's how they got the name spinners. But anyway, that's a great little pattern. Um, if you were fishing in the Catskills, that would work real well. Any place up in Colorado that they're taking surface spinners, um, I, I find that bass and bluegill take these just fine, so you can uh, fish them around here. Anyway, can you nice. describe a uh, spinner? Barry, I have a question. Yeah. Hey, hang on, hang on. Hey, Will, hang on. We got somebody in the room asking a question. Go ahead. Okay. Des describe a rise form for a fish taking a spinner. Uh, what do you mean? So the, the question is, can I describe the rise form for a fish coming up to take a spinner? Well, they, they basically come up and they, you, you think they come up and gulp it. Most of the time they do not. They open their mouth and, and there is something that's called cavitation when they open their mouth it creates a backflow into their mouth and they just let it flow into their mouth. They close their mouth and keep going. Yeah, the reason I ask is because that's always about the last thing I ever think of when I see a particular rise form, especially if they're moving side yeah. to side. Yep. And uh, very subtle. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it, it's not like you see our bass where they come out of the water and attack it from above. It's, 
it's um, I've heard it described as sipping them. Right. And I think it ain't going anywhere. I think that's a good yeah. It's not swimming away from him very rapidly. It's just laying there dead in the water, <coughs> and he just comes up and sips that thing right into his mouth. So, Will, you had a question. Will, Will, you there? <coughs> Must have lost him. All right, Will, if you come back on, ask your question again. All right. Hey, Barry, this is Richard. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Do you ever pre-treat them, pre-treat the flies when you're tying them with the floating before you go? I, I don't pre-treat them when I'm flying them or when I'm tying them, but I do before I fish them. I will put <coughs> some liquid gel floating on that um, Antron or polypropylene material just to coat it a little bit. It's theoretically waterproof, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do put it on there. It's kind of like belts and suspenders. Okay. Let me switch gears, and I have fallen in love with tying Catskill-style dry flies. Um, there's a great book out there uh, by Mike Valla, V-A-L-L-A, <coughs> on the legacy of a bunch of the Catskills uh, tires. Uh, Harry Darby, uh, the Debts, um, folks like that, and it, it has probably 25 different classic patterns in the book, and it's just a, it's a great read and it's a great reference if you want to tie uh, Catskill dry flies. This one um, is a quill body dry fly. Um, it's not any one in particular, it's kind of a an amalgamation of a lot of the different flies that are in there, but has a lot of the attributes <coughs> of classic dry flies. <coughs> um, tails on these were typically a mix of grizzly hackle and brown hackle, the very stiff, bigger barbs of theirs. They would take half of each and mix them together in their hands and tie on that mixed wing. I've gotten to the point where most of my tails for these I tie out of Coke de Leon rooster barbs. Um, it has the attributes of that mix of brown and grizzly and looks like motion in there. And I'll pull one of these out so you can see it. And they're very, very stiff barbs. They've got almost no webby material to them at all. And you can see the coloration in there, the variations in it. <coughs> and they make a very, very nice tail. Um, so I'm going to start my thread on the hook in there. Again, back in the back third. flip the barb off that and I'm going to take and get 10 or 12 of these barbs and I'm going to pull them out from the rachis so they're perpendicular to it and I'm doing that such that the ends will be evened up because it's a little hard to stack stuff like this. So I just grabbed a bundle of those and I have a bundle of tail material. In this case, we talked about tail lengths earlier. I am going to tie it about a hook shank in length. <coughs> and the reason for that is I want this to set and float on the water. And if you look at a tail that's about a hook shank in length, and if I tie my hackle into the right proportion, it's going to set so that the tail and the hackle sit on the water and just the tip of the hook point will be at the surface tension. And so it's setting up very nicely on the water. If you have a longer tail, it tends to can it forward. If you tie in your hackle at too large a diameter, 
it's usually like one and a half the hook diameter. We'll, we'll work with that in a minute. But if you'll do that kind of hackle diameter and the tail length here, it'll sit very nicely on the water. So I'm going to tie those in. I'm going to measure a hook shank the length, transfer that to my other hand, tie those in. And Jeff, you'll notice there I actually started them on the near side of the hook. I did notice that, yeah. Knowing that when I wrap my thread around it, it's going to pull it up to the top. So again, I've just done this enough. I know what the material's going to do. I'm anticipating the problem of it rolling over to the side. And I just started it, um, you know, if you were looking at the front of the hook shank, I tied it in at the 9 o'clock position rather than the 10 o'clock position. So that when it rolled back up there, it rolled up to the top of the hook shank. I'm going to bind that down real good. And wow, my hands are shaking tonight. I'm on so much allergy medicine that I can't operate my hands. Okay. Um, now, this next part. We're going to make the body of the fly. Again, I want an underbody in there that's kind of tapered such that when I make the body, it will have a tapered body. I'm actually going to use a quill or a rachis or a stem, whichever one you want to call it, from a feather. And I have, this is Let's see what Whiting says this is. This is um, just American rooster saddle in Grizzly. And so it's big old floppy feathers. And I like it because it's got great stems. So I'm going to take one of those out of there. pluck a single feather and you're going to look at this and go what a waste of a good feather yeah it is but and you you can actually buy um, that they sell they'll, you'll see them as uh, red quill stems they sell a packet of just stems the problem that I have with them is if you use them you almost have to soak them in water first because they are so dried out and brittle that you're not, you will not be able to do what I'm going to do with this. What I find is when you get one off of uh, an actual skin, I, I don't have to soak them in water. It probably would be a good idea because about 1 in 10 still does break on you, but mostly I don't have to. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this feather and I'm going to strip off all the barbs on both sides. And so what I'm going to wind up with is just a bare naked stem. And the interesting thing about this is I want a tapered body. So I'm going to tie this in from the skinny end first. And I've, I've got this completely stripped. I'm going to move you back there someplace. I've got this completely stripped down to the point where it's just got a little bit of stuff at the end. And I'm going to clip that off with my scissors. So now I have, if I can hold on to it, just a bare stem. Okay? And you'll notice the fact this was a grizzly bottle in there. If you'll notice, there's graduations, there's different colors on the stem. The stem most of the time reflects the barb pattern if it's natural. Not if it's a dyed skin, but if it's a natural grizzly like this one, you can see the variations in that, and those will show up in the body and give a very cool effect. All right, so I'm going to start that on here, tie that in, bind it down back to where my... tail starts. 
And then I'm going to wrap this on there, and I'm going to use pretty tight adjacent touching wraps. And I'm just going to wrap up the body. And again, if you were using those prepackaged quills, it's about right here that it would break on me and come completely unraveled. Is this the, the classic uh, pattern? Or yeah, it the is. From the, the quill from a rooster feather is the, is the classic material <coughs> used for this type fly. So I'm going to pull it up to about the two-thirds point, and I'm going to tie that off. And I like a couple of wraps over the top of it, and a couple in front, and it in, a, it in effect creates a locking wrap in there. So I've got wraps above it and below it, and I've tied them in pretty tight, and I cinch that down. That quill is now locked in there because and the reason that matters is if that wrap were to turn loose, that thing's going to come loose like a slinky off of this thing. And by the way, you get a little sharp uh, trout tooth in there that clips one of those, and it'll do the same thing. Now, there's two schools of thoughts. One of the schools of thought is that when that sucker comes unwound like that, it actually becomes a more effective fly because it's all gnarly looking in there. But I, I don't want my fly to do that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little UV and I'm going to try to apply just a very, very sparse coat of UV to that quill. And it does a couple of things. Number one, it will lock those in there so that no matter what the fish's tooth does to it, it won't come loose, and it also actually magnifies, I think, the striations in the body in there. So you can see that makes a really cool looking segmented body. Okay, um, traditionally the Catskill dry flies are winged with lemon wood duck. Now, what is lemon wood duck? Well, there is no such thing as a lemon wood duck. They're referring to the color. And it, there, there are two uh, distinct feathers on the, uh, on the flanks of, of a wood duck. One of them has a black bar on it, and you can buy those as well. This one does not use that feather. It is one that's from further up on the, the wing coat, or not the wing coat, it's the, uh, the side pocket, and it does not have that bark, but it's got really cool striations to it. Now, um, it was tied this way because they had this material a lot, and it looks great as a wing. Do you have to have lemon wood to No. I tie these with a golden dyed mallard flank that you can find in almost any uh, tying store. So it, the difference to me is the lemon wood duck has got very, very nice even ends to them and it makes the top of the wing look very good. Uh, if you were to look at, and here's the alternative, you can see this is um, Cabela's Mallard Barred Flank Wood Duck. Um, so they even say that it's emulating wood duck. But if you look at one of these feathers, and it's probably not a great example, but the ends are much more... Um, choppy. So it, to me, doesn't make quite as good looking uh, a feather, but to put it in perspective, uh, this is a pack of, of 10 of the actual wood duck feathers, and I think I paid like $5.95 for this. I probably paid 6 bucks for this bag of, you know, 5,000 mallard flank feathers. Um, 
only somebody that was looking at it very closely could tell the difference between the two. So don't feel bad if you substitute the mallard for that. But I'm going to take, and I'm, like I did on the previous hackle, I'm going to take a batch of these barbs and pull them out perpendicular to the rachis. And I'm just going to pluck those off. And I'm going to kind of bundle those up. And I want this to be about a hook shank in length for the wing. So I'm going to transfer that to my hand. And I'm going to bind that down. And I'm going to clip off the tag end of that. And I'm going to use my fingers to straighten all that material up and I'm going to come in behind it with my thread so that it stands up like a wing. Okay, now in traditional cat scale dry flies, you would come in and you would separate that bundle into two parts and you would use a figure eight wrap between them to create two very distinct looking wings that stand up. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I defy you to tell the difference between what this looks like when you tie it in as a single wing versus the split wings because once they, especially once you cast them, they this, this will look like two wings because it kind of naturally separates out there. So if you want to be completely authentic, you split the wings, you figure eight them, you put a couple of binding wraps around each one, which will take you about 15 minutes just to do that. Or you can just tie it in as a single shank like this. At this point, we're ready to tie in a hackle around that to finish off the fly. And I'm going to try to select something of an appropriate length in here if I can find them. And this is a grizzly saddle hackle from Whiting again. In the midge size. What I'm looking for, I want something that's going to be one to one and a half times the hook gate. So I'll put them on there and see if we got lucky. And you can do this with a hackle gauge, or you can just bend them like that. You can see that's slightly longer than the hook gate in there, so that's going to work fine. And I'm going to take and strip off some of the barbs on there so that I've got a piece of bare stem and I'm going to tie that in behind the wing and move in front of the wing and tie it down. <clears throat> Come in and trip off, clip off the uh, stem that's left there and I'm going to try to manipulate this such that it winds up with the, well, it's not one to work for me. Yeah. I want the shiny side of the feather, which is the out, outer part, or the uh, convex side, facing the front of the fly. And you'll find different, oops, that's sharp. You'll find different uh, patterns call for, sometimes they want it going forward. A lot of the Tenkara flies will call for that going the opposite direction so that the hackle is actually cupped forward. But in this case, I want it cupped backwards. And I'm going to come in, and I'm using my fingers to kind of preen those barbs back because your objective is to get those down there 
and not capture them so that they're going all wonky and facing forward. Okay, I got that tied down. I'm going to slip in with my scissors. And one trick with your scissors, if you reach in and clip things, anything that's in your scissors is going to get clipped. When I pull up on the rachis like that, and I reach in with my scissors and push forward, it's pulling that rachis down into the V of the scissors, and it'll only cut that the stem of that feather. It won't because I can't tell you how many times I've reached in there to clip my hackle off and there went my wing at the same time. Okay, um, take my whip finish tool and apply about a three or four turn whip finish at that point. And my thread nicely separated by itself. And there you go. I'll turn that so you can see it from a lot of different angles. To me, that wing looks a little bit long, and it's interesting because I measured it in there a hook shank in length. I'd like for that to be about an eighth of an inch shorter than that for, for my personal taste. You'll see them in, uh, in uh, uh, Paul's book that I talked about. Some of them are really, really long. Um, but one of the things... I don't know if I can get something up here to show you this. If I drop that, where are, where are you? Well, I can't get it to focus. But when I just drop that thing onto the surface, it sits there in an upright position just like I'd like for it to. All right, and that's a Catskill quill body dry fly. Any questions from any of the folks on Zoom? No, nobody's coming off a of mute, so it must be all okay. If you, sometimes when you're when you're using uh, pheasant uh, or, or peacock feather, you can reinforce it with. With thread. Right. Can you do that with quills and, and biots or things that um, you're... you You don't normally see it when you're palmering a hackle. Um, I don't. It, you could. The the tendency though, when you have the thread, and the question was, uh, when you're tying on uh, uh, peacock hurl or something like that, it, it's fairly delicate and sometimes you wrap a thread in with it to reinforce it. And the question is, could you do that with a hackle? Um, you, you certainly could, but I think you would tend to capture a lot of the barbs. And what happens when you capture them in there, either with the rachis or with thread or something, they tend to go in all kinds of different directions. So. I don't. I don't traditionally see people doing that. What about quills and biots? Some of the some of the brittle stuff. That, that yeah, I like you. I like UV. <laughs> ah, that's it. <coughs> so, any any other questions? I, I saw a yellow salad pattern uh, that was using some esoteric uh, quill for lab, and I had a, a yellow one in my box. And I soaked it in hot water. Yep. And I could wrap that just like a quill, yep. just, just like a, a, a tackle. Yep. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a pain in the ass to tie down, uh, but uh, it really looks great. Yep. I, I would imagine it would. Yeah, you can, any material you have that is extremely brittle, just soak it in a little warm water for five minutes before you tie it in. You'll find that that brittleness probably goes away. Okay. Whose uh, oh. who's UV do you like? Because I've uh, got some that ends up just sticky and nasty. I, and I, 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 I'm tying with Solares. Um, I like it. I also like Deer Valley. Um, 
the, the only one that I think was not particularly great was, you know, one of the first people that came out with this was Clear Cure Goo. And they have since gone out of business. And I think the reason they went out of business is that stuff never set up. It was tacky no matter what you did to it. This, this stuff sets up hard. And what I used to do with the clear cure goo is I would put a coat of, you know, I'd cure it with the light and everything. And then I'd put a coat of Sally Hansen's on top of it so it wasn't sticky in my box. Yeah, but with the, the solar res and the Deer Valley, I've not had that problem at all. I use a lot of fun. It's a little bit cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> see, I, I, have the, I have this theory that if you follow their supply chain back, it's all came in, coming out of the same 55-gallon drum. I think you're right. <laughs> I can't prove that, but I suspect it very strongly. Okay, thank you very much. So a Zoom audience, we're going to take a break and we'll come back in about an hour. So we'll talk to you then. And for those of you that...